So Jack, I did not stay up this time uh, or wake up really early to watch a presidential debate, but it was the vice president debate last night. Did you see any clips? I did see clips. I actually, I don't know why I woke up at like 3.30 in the morning. Oh but, no, the disease I mean, is catching up. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm getting it from you. We're spending too much time together on this podcast. What news stories mattered most this week in the world of media and advertising? Welcome to the Media Leader Podcast. I'm Omar Oaks. And I'm Jack Benjamin. And this week we will be discussing Amazon's UK upfronts, paywalls at CNN and Reuters, and much more. Um, I've also just at the time of recording come from a Wackle Presents event. Uh, Women in Advertising and Communications Leadership, Karen Stacey, um, who is the Wackle President and also the CEO of Digital Cinema Media. I spoke to her and Vice President Claire Sadler and I'll bring you that interview um, after we get through some of the most important stories that mattered this week, Jack. Um, And you've been a busy man about town. Um, so you, you've you been talking to Pinterest, who have lots to say about how they're developing um, products and services. Um, but first, I want to ask you about Amazon, the UK upfront. Um, by the time this recording, this podcast episode comes out on Thursday, people will be able to read about that on the Media Leader website. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been given some advance notice about what they're going to talk about. Um, so what are the headlines? What's Amazon up to? That's right. Um, yeah, their, their upfronts are being hosted this evening. I believe it's at Soho House, um, central London. And I think the main takeaway is that they're announcing their UK reach figures for Amazon Prime Video for the first time. Ooh, and tell me, tell me, who's watching? How many people? 19 million users are watching Amazon Prime Video in the UK uh, monthly, but that more than half of those Prime Video viewers do not watch any paid linear TV in the UK. So it really highlights the movement to streaming as opposed to linear. And further, um, among those Prime Video users, they were found to spend 36% more on Amazon.co.uk. So that really... Which t- is the whole point. That's the whole point. I mean, yeah, Amazon Prime Video has always been a loss leader. Um, and, and the business has known that. And it seems like there's a great reason for it because that investment's being made up in the fact that it's driving more sales, more retail sales, um, higher margins, part of higher margin part of, parts of the business. So those were some of the main takeaways. Um, they're also exp- uh, going to announce some new ad formats which I'm sure advertisers will be interested to know about. Um, they include shoppable video ads, pause ads, and carousel ads, and those will be launched in sometime in 2025. Um, no specific date yet for the UK market, but they'll be coming soon. And it's similar. Lots of other streamers have announced similar ad, new ad formats. That sort of shoppability is a really big part of turning TV from a sort of um, brand type of campaign into a more performance or at least for full funnel campaign um, optionality. So um, it's really important to a lot of these streamers to to get those types of ad formats up and in and uh, offer them to advertisers. Yeah, um, very interesting. And that that 19 million in terms of audience, did that come, that come from Barb numbers? Because they're a, they're a Barb subscriber, are they not? Um, you know, actually, I, I so we talked. To, I talked to Amazon uh, in advance of the upfronts, and I I am not sure that that's coming from Barb. Um, but Barb is uh, Amazon is a member of Barb, so I'd imagine that someone is verifying those figures. They're just simply communicated to me via Amazon, and that Barb wasn't mentioned. Yeah, and um, anything anything on the content side as well, because um, um, Phil Phil Christer, who um, mm-hmm. the the lead in the UK, um, he was at a Thinkbox event, um, which we reported on. Uh, there were lots of headlines from Origin um, on the panel that he was on with ITV Sky and uh, Channel Four. But um, very interesting um, noises coming out of um, him. He was saying he how. The, you know, they haven't even started yet. You know, we've only just launched um, ads on Prime Video mm. and we've not really kind of gone into all the things that we want to do with Amazon, MGM, mm. Twitch. Um, did, you, did you hear anything about content specifically, what they plan to do? Yeah, there, well, there will be people from MGM Studios that are at the upfronts um, and there's going to be loads of sort of celebs on there to promote some specific original programming. Um, Rings of Power is a is, that launched recently its second season. Um, I think the latest stats are like 50 million people have already watched the uh, first two episodes. Um, so uh, I think they're actually uh, intending to uh, give a, a exclusive trailer for the last episode of the series, which seems a little 
I mean, maybe I'm just w- way well behind. I watched the first episode just last weekend, so actually it might be further further along than I than than I know. Um, but so that's a, that's definitely a big one. There's a, a spy action series called Citadel that stars Priyanka Chopra Jonas as well as Idris Elba. Um, they're promoting that pretty heavily. Um, some new work from Orlando Bloom, Bryce Dallas How- Howard. There's an uh, action comedy called Deep Cover that they're looking to promote. And there's also Young Sherlock, which is directed by Guy Ritchie, um, that, that will be coming as well. And so it's a mix of using different properties that, that maybe were owned by MGM and that Amazon has, has otherwise sort of sought to purchase or, or develop uh, completely new IP internally. And so there's there's lots in terms of the new content that they're wanting to promote. Um I actually personally don't spend a whole lot of time on Amazon Prime Video. I know some people that are big fans of some of these series. Um, and also then they're looking to promote live sports as another part of their uh, product launch. I mean, they've, they've invested a lot in in the U.S. Thursday night football. They The viewership on those has been breaking records each week. So um, seems like a big success for them there. And then in Europe, the they have the Champions League on Tuesdays. So people can watch uh, a number of games every Tuesday via Amazon Prime Video. And that's that that will definitely drive more viewership. Yeah, that's a, that's a very big thing. And when you think about all the, the product placement, branded content things that they may want to start doing as well, mm-hmm. um, huge. God, t- tough times for broadcasters when you're having to deal with these international global mega tech platforms who are ha- you know apparently happy to have you know their their, their media vehicle as a as a loss leader to sell more dishwasher tablets and you know. Well, that's ex- exactly right. I mean, Amazon has a lot of money to throw on Apple too. Um, yeah. They don't clearly care to make their streaming services uh, immediately profitable like some of the other streaming services, like Warner Brothers Discovery has sought to make uh, Max profitable and, and made some cuts that have uh, annoyed some consumers. But Amazon doesn't have this problem because they're using it as a loss leader and they can drive up the cost of sports rights, as we've talked about. Yeah, well, that I mean, that can always change, right? You've seen what happened when Steve Jobs departed this earth and... Tim Cook took over Apple, where they, you know, when you when you when you're not the founder, when you're not that kind of mercurial figure who's willing to kind of make big long term bets um, for some short term pain, it's very difficult for you know um, someone to follow that. In the case of Andy Jassy, I think it's fair to say that um, Jeff Bezos's um, influence still reigns pretty supreme in that organization. You even heard it during, um, I'm going off topic here, but um, the Amazon uh, media pitch uh, that a lot of um, of the world's biggest ad agency networks went for recently. You heard about how it was during the pitch process and you heard this like this thing that Jeff Bezos always had at Amazon who's running it about how we have to be really thoughtful about meetings. Mm. So what would happen? The first 10, 15 minutes of any meeting at Amazon, no one talks. You're all kind of like sitting there in silence, like a library, or reading the meeting agenda. Because wow. Bezos knows what we all know is that nobody reads meeting agendas before <laughs> they go to them. <laughs> She's like, right, if we're going to have a meeting, you are going to sit there for 10 minutes and you're going to read. And we're going to really think about what we're going to say to each other in this meeting. Huh. And that's how we're going to run it. Plus, a great thing that Bezos does is Jeff, when Jeff's in the room, he's the last one to speak. Because he wants the, he wants the, the, the more junior you are, the earlier you speak. Mm. Because if Jeff or the CEO of your organization speaks first, the junior person is always going to take the more senior person's lead. Right, so you right. don't actually um, get a thoughtful debate if that's what you want from the meeting. Um, and those those pitch meetings for Amazon's media account by, by people I talk to, that were run just like that. Mm. So that's a sign of how, you know, I think for the foreseeable future, you are still going to have this, this approach, this strategic approach to Amazon Prime Video where... What are we in the business of doing? We are a retail logistics company. That is how we make money. Mm. Everything we do is in the service of that. Um, so um, I think we have to be very mindful of whatever we hear from an Amazon upfront. So that's still their core business. However, a very different sort of business is Pinterest. Um, also full of major events and announcements this week. Jack, what were your takeaways from this Pinterest event in London this week? What new products are they offering for advertisers? And how are they looking to, I guess, I guess get us to think about their brand mm. related to other social media? Uh, that last question is definitely a really interesting question because they were, because I felt like a lot of the communication from the communication strategy from Pinterest, from Snap, from some of these challenger social media companies has trended to be sort of um, negative toward 
social media. I mean, their competitors, like they go actually, they're, they're going after them more aggressively. And I, I heard that more aggressively from anyone than Pinterest executives from this event. Um, you had their, their global chief marketing officer basically make a direct appeal to advertisers and saying like, um, I, I'll actually, I'll read the quote. I often hear from other marketers that they feel trapped by the duopoly referring <gasps> pres- pre- presumably to meta and to, to Google. Um, with signal loss and rising auction costs already looming, fellow CMOs have said to me verbatim, we need another option and we're rooting for you to win. It's time for our industry to have a better choice, a better place to spend marketing dollars because I believe marketing budgets aren't just business conversations, they're values conversations. I've got three teenagers at home and watching my own children come of age online is motivation enough to strive for a better way forward. She said, this is um, Andrea Mollard. She said, we do not need to trade our children's emotional well-being for return on ad spend. It's unconscionable to think anyone would. So they're, yeah. they're, they're really saying, Pinterest, we are positive. And to be fair, like most people I know that use Pinterest really do just use it to like create little boards or collages of little products or items that they find aesthetically pleasing or whatever that they use it for. Um, so it's there's not like that sort of like, mental health emotional problem going on with like likes and did this person comment something really heinous or toxic or you know, there's less of that to be fair to that to, to the platform um but it was a really strong message and that was only a small part of course of what was presented but um i, I was struck by how they're wanting to position their brand different to a lot of their competitors really saying if you if you advertisers say you care about a more positive online space, like put your money where your mouth is and, and come to us and come to other um, organizations, social media organizations um, that are at least a little bit more positive um, and, and help create a more competitive marketplace. But sorry, but they need to back that up with the business case as well. It's not enough just to say we're positive, come spend with us. And so they did a, a lot of work at the event to, to also make the business case for why Pinterest is much more appealing to advertisers now than it may have been a few years ago. Yeah. Do you, do you sense a conflict there? Because it's been very clear from the noises from Pinterest this year that they want to promote um, their reach among a Gen Z, not Gen Z, a Gen Z That's right. uh, younger audience. Um, we've had that previous podcast episode uh, with Milka Priva Devanova, um, the EMEA uh, lead at Pinterest. Um, we at Can Lions this year, they had a big presence on um, the beach at Can Lions, where it was very clear they were targeting, you know, um, younger people. Um, they had kind of things like get, get a tattoo done. Oh yeah, yeah, know, right. All, all, it was like fun things that really, and you saw that, that to their credit, it was a really well attended space. There was a queue going down the Quasette and it was like a, a very young looking queue, if I can mm. say it that way. Um, does, do you feel that there's a conflict where they, they're very clear that they 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 want, they kind of want to shed this image that they're kind of for, for mums and parents who are doing crafty things or you know pinning wedding dresses and all the like um they 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 want to reach a younger audience they have a younger audience but at the same time they're trying to present themselves as being the the safer choice yeah i think well it's it's a great point and they're walking that line it's a pretty fine line but they're walking it um so the ceo uh, bill reddy described that i think it was 40% of pinterest users are gen z so it, it they do have a, a young audience that they're that they're pushing, um, and the way that they're selling it is these young people are coming to Pinterest to like with an open mind about discovering new brands, new new items for whether it's they're decorating uh, their first apartment or whether they're looking for the next trendy outfit that is fitting along TikTok trends or some other you know sort of cultural trends, right? Um, and so there's an intentionality to the use of Pinterest that might be different than just like someone slipping through videos on Instagram reels or YouTube shorts, not necessarily looking for some, some level of interaction with brands or products. The argument that Pinterest is making is that people are coming to Pinterest because they want to discover some new products. And so they've come up with new tools to make um, the sort of performance advertising a lot better on Pinterest to meet that demand. So there's more shoppability, um, the UK MD Beth Horn was like, we want to make everything shoppable on Pinterest. That's sort of the goal. Um, at the same time, they don't want to actually have transactions on Pinterest, which is different from like Meta, which has its own marketplaces mm. on on mm. Facebook. They just wanted to make it as seamless as possible for when someone sees a product on Pinterest, whether it's advertised or otherwise, that if they click, I want to buy that, then it goes to the app 
or the website directly, and they can make that purchase off Pinterest app. They did not want to integrate that into Pinterest, which I think is actually quite interesting, very different from some other competitors. Um, yeah, and I think um, to the to the performance thing as well, probably the most major announcement for advertisers in terms of that new tools is this performance plus uh, solution, which is a suite of ad tools to make it as easy as possible for advertisers to do campaigns and spend money on Pinterest. We're similar to a lot of other social media companies. Like the reason why so many people spend on Meta is just as easy to spend on Meta and it meets basic KPIs. So Pinterest is wanting to make it really easy to spend on them um, where the AI can sort of automate a lot of stuff for you, for advertisers. Yeah. <laughs> so, so still a world, a social media world, a platform world of walled gardens and you just, you know, advertisers, they just want to reach audiences and it's, you know, it's, it's when you, when you have to kind of buy direct from them, it just creates all of this, this difficulty mm-hmm. and it's, and it benefits the the larger operators as well, obviously because scale and network effects matter. Before we get to our interview, with Karen Stacy, let's do the cut for time bit where we ask each other what else has been happening. And in a very short amount of time, <laughs> a criminally short amount of time, what do we think about it? Um, so Jack Tortoise, remember them? Talked about them last week. Very slow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, only by brand. Uh, they're having very. They're having trouble convincing observer journalists and editors. Uh, remember that they're they're due to buy the the news brand from Guardian. Um, journalists are in uproar of the purchase of the paper. Apparently, and they passed a vote of no confidence in the Scott Trust, the owners of the Guardian, after it was announced um, that Tortoise is an exclusive talks to buy the Observer. What's their problem, Jack? Well, I think they're nervous about new ownership. I don't know if they feel convinced of the fact that there's going to be sufficient investment to necessarily keep everyone in, uh, involved. I mean, this is and this is based on reporting from from press because I should mention. So I haven't spoken with uh, people at the Observer personally at the moment yet. Um, but I think they're a little skeptical of the deal. I mean, Guardian and Observer journalists have some of the sort of safest jobs in journalism in the UK because of the Scott Trust, because there's a there's just a level of security where I don't think the Guardian or the Observer have ever had mandatory layoffs, not ever, certainly not any time recently, that they often ask people to take voluntary redundancy if they want yeah, to. Yeah, they, they have laid off people. I mean, you can compare the it's, workforce compared to five years ago, it's smaller, right? That's Yes, I think the point being that they haven't technically forced anyone out by firing them just uh, for the cause of redundancy. as a, they, When they're trying to make redundancies, they'll say, we'll buy you out if you're willing to leave. It's a little bit, I mean, it, maybe it's a difference without a distinction, but to me, it's a little bit different than some of the other papers where we just need to reduce a huge amount of staff and you're gone. So there's a level of job security that I think some of these uh, editors and journalists feel they have currently underneath the, uh, the Scott Trust and, and the Guardian. And if they're sold out from that, they just don't know. I don't know if they're convinced that um, Harding, who owns Tortoise, is willing to really put up sufficient investment to make them feel safe. Do they have do they have the resources that, that the Guardian has and the Scott Trust has? Maybe not. So um they just seemed a little bit sounds like skeptical of Well they should do they should do their job and find out. They should ask they should ask some, <laughs> they should ask some questions well, and they, they should are. they should ask some people who would know and find out. I mean, you know, I, I know I know change is always there's always a risk that comes with change, but I think it's fair to say the observer hasn't um pulled up trees in the last 10 years under its ownership of Guardian News and Media. I mean, this is the oldest Sunday newspaper going. You know, this is this is a huge brand that you you might have forgotten had even existed. Mm. Um, this, I mean, come on, come I, on. Well, I, I mean, if you don't like Tortoise, who would you have buy it? You well, I, 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 think, I think a lot of this will end up being settled. I think they just need to see a proper business plan, which they haven't been communicated yet. So there's been like talks about, yeah, Tortoise wants to invest $5 million uh, per year into the brand over the next five years. But what does that look like? Where's the money coming from? Who's financing it? None of that's really been just been communicated to observer staff and them being good journalists. They want to know that information. Well, good. Hopefully they will find out. In other news, Elon Musk's X is now worth less than a quarter of its 44 billion purchase price, according to a new estimate from investor Fidelity that came out earlier this week. I wanted to ask you if you're surprised it's not even lower than that. It's it's not worth anything. If you think about it, it's not worth anything. Like, okay, quick history lesson. He bought it for $44 billion. It was a massively inflated price. Way overpaid, that, yeah. That, 
was so badly overpaid, he tried to get out of it. Twitter had to threaten to take him to court. They did take him to court in order to commit to that. Um, And now when you think about the debt that had to be raised to pay for it, this isn't coming out of Elon Musk's pocket. It's Mm -hmm. coming out of debt. It's coming out of Tesla stock. It's coming out of investment from Saudi Arabia. Who are not making their money back ever. (laughs) Yeah. It's unbelievable. This, this kind, and look, you've taken one of the world's most famous media brands, Twitter, and you've turned it into X, a letter which is literally <laughs> something you use when you can't think of the thing. X person went to Y party, right? Yeah, right. This company is not worth ten billion dollars. Um, we all know that it's not being run properly as um, an effective ad-funded organization. We know that he has this warped idea that I'm this big influential billionaire and I need to have a media property to invest whatever crazy agenda I have. He's been he's been very vocal about it during the selection um, where he's been promoting Donald Trump with just the most embarrassing, glitchy Twitter spaces interviews. The whole thing is weird. This is not a $10 billion company. Immediate Media has launched a full-scale first-party data solution. It's called Prism, and it features a suite of solutions, including planning, research, and insights. Uh, Also, advanced targeting options, data matching and modeling, contextual targeting, all the buzzwords that everyone thinks. Yeah, it is buzzwords. But Jack, why should advertisers care about this? Well, I think... First of all, first party data solutions uh, have become much more important for advertisers, for publishers, even though Google hasn't decided to deprecate third party cookies, sort of seems like the whole industry is still sort of moving on past the cookie as best as it can, um, even though that is happening very slowly. And so first party data solutions become very valuable and publishers have a lot of first party data. Uh, I think immediate counts something like over 20 million readers uh, of its various different brands. And so they know quite a bit about their audience um, and they want to make that easy for people to utilize in a variety of different ways. And that even includes through uh, contextual targeting um, in terms of sometimes they can tell you now with the help of, uh, you know, AI solutions that um, someone who has never read anything from immediate media, a completely new customer, what they still would be most likely to uh, find um, appealing in terms of advertising based on the one article that they have clicked into for the first time. So for instance, if you're on good food and you click a certain type of recipe, they could probably guess pretty well what type of a person you are. Um, now, it's never going to be absolutely perfect. And I think they would admit that that's a, that predictive level is uh, a little bit more cutting edge. But it's interesting that, that it's still part of the solution if that's something that you want. Otherwise, yeah, go for um, other more advanced targeting options using the data. Um, I think the question sort of becomes, is it enough reach? Because loads of companies have great first party data. I mean, talk about the walled gardens, right? I mean, you're essentially competing with Meta and Google. You're competing with um, anyone that's bigger than immediate media. Right, which is a, frankly a lot of people, even though immediate does have a lot of uh, quite quite a bit of reach itself. Um, so my question will be in the future whether or not we would see more publishers sort of start pooling data. We saw this with Independent making a deal with BuzzFeed so that they could pool the whole first party data among all of those publications. It makes it a lot more appealing to advertisers, more useful. So I'd be curious to see sort of all these different first party data solutions that come up, not just immediate, but all these different publishers, whether or not they would be more useful having more collaboration between publishers on it. Yeah, I, th- I think there might be a danger, though, in um, conflating uh, a news brand like The Independent with uh, a specialist. That's definitely publisher, true. That's like definitely immediate, true. Immediate, um, because the thing about a news brand is the news business, you know, your content can become commodified. Um, whereas Immediate Media, you, you mentioned BBC Good Food magazine, You, you know, if I'm... Even if I'm not a, a an avid uh, chef at home, you know, sometimes I'll need to Google a recipe and you'll land on a title like that's mm-hmm. website. And mm-hmm. that that kind of data is is important. Um, for, for who, what kind of people are coming into your website and why? I, I would think advertisers um, would be particularly interested in yeah, yeah. So, these magazine so, brands so, data. Yeah. yeah, so as targeting, as we move beyond the cookie and targeting becomes better in terms of actually contextual advertising solutions and finding out more about your audiences and why they come to your website, not just these kind of broad uh, demographic targeting tools. 
um, it, you can get some really interesting results with specialist media. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'm kind of talking my own book because because we're, <laughs> we're trade media, right? Yeah. And we have yeah. our own specialist content. But that's that's the world. That's what the internet is doing to the publishing industry at large. You know, it's kind of unfortunately for news brands, commodified news content is becoming less valuable, and specialist um, content um, will always have that value we just need to move to a, a model where publishers are able to get the full value of that mm-hmm. it's not just you know i don't want to get into a conversation about ai but you know um you don't want to just have google just hiving all of your content and just creating a gen ai um views thing on overviews yeah overviews um without giving um credit to the publisher other big publishing news uh that we're we've been tracking we will continue to track um, the Telegraph still being put up for sale. And notably, Sir Paul Marshall dropped out of the bidding. He didn't submit a bid um, actually by the deadline of the end of last week. So he's he bought The Spectator, but he's, he's out on The Telegraph. He also owns Unheard, uh, GB News. Uh, he did uh, recently acquire uh, or he invested in The Free Press, which is a US-based sort of newsletter run by Barry Weiss, which is it's a bit right wing slash trying to be right different. wing shocker yeah well there you go um i was just curious it's i mean it seemed like this is was a bit of a surprise i'm curious if you what you make of marshall not being involved and um do you know who who, who might be getting the telegraph do we know uh no i don't personally um but yeah, it was it was notable that um he appointed uh, former cabinet minister and uh, Times leader writer Michael Gove to editor of the right. Spectator. Um, a lot of people regard uh, it, mean, it means that Fraser Nelson is out. Um, suggestions being that this that um, Gove will actually report to someone at Unheard, um, who you mentioned, and Fraser Nelson apparently wasn't willing to do that mm. um you know michael gove is a proper journalist lest you forget really worth going on youtube and googling um his chat show that he had on channel four <laughs> in the early 90s <laughs> you know he's been doing this for a while long before um he was a conservative politician um so you know he he is someone who knows how to make noise get attention for himself um the spectator um clearly um, under Fraser Nelson's editorship wanted to do that as well. And, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the other properties that Sir Paul Marshall has invested in, definitely wants to create this this ecosystem of right-wing mm. uh, media properties who are going to, you would expect, um, help each other out and form this 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 synthetic right-wing and um, very brash, confident um, vibe um, and... GB News is at the forefront of doing that, but actually, I think Unheard is the is the most interesting among them. Where you, you have to remember that Paul Marshall, he comes from a Lib Dem background, and I don't think he would see himself as a Tory. Really, I think he's always seen kind of like Brexit Tory land as as a vehicle nowadays for pushing his libertarian agenda. I think he's mm. always been a libertarian. If you look at his history, um, whether there is a big enough audience for that i don't know um i made a joke before about you know shocker right wing you know there's a hell of a lot of right wing media if, you, if you're minded to kind of choose your media based on that and i just don't know whether the marketplace is big enough in the uk for that so remains to be seen mm. well uh, telegraph's not included so yeah but um yeah perhaps just um just doesn't need it yeah we'll see but finally, Reuters and CNN have both announced they will introduce metered paywalls for their websites. CNN is going to charge its users £3.99. $3.99. Three pounds yeah. per month. Uh, and Reuters will charge $4 per month. A for, whole cent difference. Yeah, for unlimited <laughs> access to articles. Um, Jack, um, do you think paywalls are going to work for them? Are you going to, are you going to sign up? Uh, no, I'm not going to personally sign up I, I mean i find them quite you can useful get it on expenses if i can get yeah but, well if i can expense it i in, in particular you know reuters has been uh, a really useful resource i mean uh and, and cnn has to be fair as well i mean they do great original journalism i think cnn's like the third most visited website in the u.s market so i mean i understand why they want to put up a paywall and you have mark thompson who's coming over from you know x bbc x new york times I mean, say probably looked at CNN being like, we get all this traffic and we're not monetizing it properly. So let's put it behind a paywall. So it makes sense for, for, for these companies to do it, but I don't know if it's a net positive. And I don't, I don't know how many people are going to want to pay 
for especially like something like CNN. I could see Reuters getting um, a lot of interest from especially like business types. Anyone that could expense something, Reuters, um, you know, as, as, certainly as a news agency is useful in that respect. But then also its original reporting is quite good as well. Um, I wonder if CNN will look to bundle their subscription, similar to how like the New York Times model added cooking and games, various other things. Um, I mean, Warner Brothers Discovery, which owns CNN, also owns lots of interesting properties that I wonder you could maybe look to bundle the subscription with eventually. Um, but like, there's, I'm, I'm a bit burned from the whole CNN Plus experiment that failed. It's a little bit different because that was like its own streaming uh, product. And that was launched separately from HBO Max at the time and then sort of integrated. Like, it just was a complete mess and the timing was all off because it happened just before the Warner Brothers, uh, Warner Media and Discovery merger. Um, this is different just because it's just sort of putting up a paywall to the website. So it's not necessarily competing with other products that were in development. Um, so, I mean, to me, it would make sense if Warner Brothers was like, hey, you could subscribe to both CNN and Max for less than, uh, you know, maybe each individual, less than, less than Max individually. But you also get CNN if you as, if, as long as you're cool with that bundle, similar to the sort of New York Times model. Um, and then you get maybe more subscribers that way. Um, and then from there, you can maybe start to add more things like Warner Brothers Discovery develops quite a few games. Would people pay for CNN uh, if the, CNN.com if that also meant that they could play a free Harry Potter game or something? I mean, there, there's a lot of interesting IP and licensing that could be done. I'm not saying that's I have any idea that that's uh, in the pipeline, but um, I would think that they will need to do some work to attract some people to subscribe to either of these, um, both CNN, but also Rogers. Okay, thanks, Jack. We're going to move on to our interview with Karen Stacey, uh, CEO of Digital Cinema Media and president of WACL this year. Um, and we also talked to Claire Sadler, who is vice president for the next year. I attended WACL's, uh, WACL's Presents event this morning where they talked about new initiatives and what they want to be more inclusive um, for the 100 101 year old organization and new funding, um, new ways of partnering with organizations as they want to uh, make it more sustainable and stronger for the future. This is the first time you've done this Wackle Presents event. Let me ask both of you first, Karen, why, do, why have you chosen to do it? So I think over the last six, seven years, we've really motored forward with a clear purpose on what we bring into the industry. And when you sit back and you look at everything we've done, one, we should sh share about it, shout about it, because otherwise we're just talking in our own echo chamber. And I think we, the biggest thing we know is telling women how to help themselves is, or how we can help them is one thing telling the men is is the one that we're, where you're going to get the real breakthrough so I think that was really important and on the other um, so when we were looking at the work we're trying to do um, we had Nishma and I actually had a conversation last year when I was VP and as VP and being a commercial person I was like oh god it just feels like all these projects are so amazing but we literally go cap in hand each committee and we should stand up and present as one all the things we're doing and then ask people to get involved. And also, there needs to be more of a value exchange. So again, when I spoke to Nikki Hare, it was about, let's create packages that have a real value exchange. So when people are a partner, they're a partner. They're not just badging something. And so to tell that story, you've got to put some work into it, put some effort into it, present it at a cinema, because that's... Every strategy looks better when it's on a big screen. Um, and and that's what we've done. So it's taken six months in the making of just sort of, you know, getting the people, getting there. We had no shortage of volunteers. And then making sure Claire and I were really, uh, did a lot of work on what the story. And hopefully, for you in the audience, the story came over loud and clear and the benefits to everybody and the fact that we want to be benefit everybody not just women yeah absolutely i mean claire well, do you think that as well do you think wackle um should be more inclusive as it you know it's just celebrated 100 years last year as it looks towards the next 100 do you think in general it needs to be more inclusive um i think we are already inclusive and part of today 
uh, was sharing all the work that we do. As, as Karen mentioned, you know, ten, over 10 years ago, Gideon wrote, it's, it's Le Capital's best kept secret. Um, but the work that we do, is, it goes far beyond speaker dinners, which is, I think is probably the perception of WACL and what um, many many of the industries sort of see as our, our public face but our, our work reaches far beyond that and you've seen that today in terms of how we support women within leadership positions who are already in senior leadership positions but also how we inspire the next generation of talent which is absolutely critical if we want to create a more gender equal industry we have to have that pipeline of women and you know we are inclusive in the way that we do that particularly um, in the last couple of years with um, the clarity around our strategy, we have included men within our panel discussions with all those sort of talent sessions that have gone around the country have gone around the country. Um, they're, they're allies. They come, they come, they speak, they support. Um, so I think we have I think the days of it being perhaps a, a, what might have been perceived a while ago as a, an elite dining club is, is no longer and it hasn't been like that for a long time um, and that was to, you know very much the purpose of today we we support members we inspire talent and we're campaign for change and we want you know we can't do it alone I talked to that we can't do it alone uh, today was about setting out our stall and inviting others to join us and join us in you know adopting policies or giving us supporting us financially we want to do more um we train over five you know we've talked about training over 500 women a year what if we could make that a thousand women what if we could make that 1500 women but we can't do that alone we need you know we need partners who will support us financially or or in other ways yeah and it was really interesting um hearing nikki um, from omnicom media group talk about um the the more business-like approach i guess um having this tiered structure of how people can support wackle was really interesting and um i remember it's funny you mentioned um d dinner events and i think that was actually back in 2015 my first wackle do was a was a wackle gala i think and so martin and Sorrel was the keynote speaker. Um, interesting times. Um, and Karen, um, to, to what Claire, Claire was saying about inclusivity just now. I mean, e even um, little things just strike you sometimes. Even even the name Wackle. Wackle has had London in the title. Maybe this is recency bias because um, we've just come back from doing an event in Manchester. But um, you talked about um, some of the things that you do in Edinburgh, in Manchester, other places in the UK. Do you think Wackle needs to get out of London more? Yeah, and we... And we are, um, uh, Claire and I are talking, we have a, um, we have two jewels in Edinburgh um, and Dawn Payne in, in Liverpool and they champion the regions and we are looking about how we extend that reach into the regions because you're absolutely right, it was, um, I don't know if you know, so the, the history was that in 1923 there was some Unilever female executives coming over and there was uh, no one to take them to lunch because um, there were 30... Yeah, because the 30 Club was men only. And um, so the 30 Club then got a group of senior women in the industry at that time and said, you need to, to, group, to join a group together and entertain these women, which my daughter always said, oh, that's what it stands for, Mum, then. Women actually can lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it sort of started. And then in, it, and, and we've evolved it. And then that that's where the London came from. But as Claire said, that was dropped in probably 2016. Um, and we changed it to leadership. Um, because there was more and more out, things outside of London. And I think on the inclusivity bit, I think you can't underestimate, as a female, and I know this going in to be CEO at DCM, when you go into a business, and at that time, the business was more men at the leadership level, and the shareholders I dealt with were men. Wackle were incredible, because you go in, you have no friends when you're at the workplace. And the support I got from people like Scylla Snowball and Linz and Tess Alps and because they knew I was doing this big job and that network you just can't put it just has something magical about it and you know that we have a rule in Wackle that if you get a call from a Wackler you take it because there's there are they're, they're, ring, they're ringing you for something and I think what we've done is kept that specialness about the core group and then just thought though but we can do more there's no good just making each other special. What else can we do so so we can impart what we're doing as a group? But that uniqueness about that safe space to go and go, oh my God, I don't, you know, what am I doing here is intangible. 
Um, so it's like an invisible Ned network, isn't it? That you can go and ask people. And then, but I do think we've now at more outward facing to go, but it's no good just looking after us. What do we do about the next generation? It's no good just looking after the next generation of women. How do we help people? And people are not going to lean in unless they are dealing with facts. So the playbook is built on facts. It took Kate Walters and Joe Arden a whole year, two years. So it's all because we just know we just don't want Namby Pamby. I want this. It's got to be based in fact. And I think that's that's what's so powerful about it. So I think it's getting the essence of what it's always been is still there. And the outreach now it's got because the great work is quite incredible. Yeah, and um, um, it felt like this was a more business-like approach to, to Wackle than maybe years gone past. Is that fair, do you think? Yeah, I think it's probably more strong. I think I think it was, I think it was where Kerry Glazer was a trailblazer in her year, and she was like, "We just got to have a more of a purpose. We got to have if we were a business, and it's led by business women. We've we've got to you know we've got to make a difference. So we um so that's that's where it started, and then we just built on it. And I just think it's just so exciting because it's. Gr- because we're all business people and I'm a real return on investment person, it just feels like actually now now, we, now I'm, I'm here as a member, not only because of the gang, it's great to be in a gang, it's the work we do too. Great. And finally, how, how should people that are listening to this that maybe don't know very much about Wackle, how can they, how can they get involved? How can they lean in? So the, um, for the people that were here, there's a QR code. We've created a lot of packages to get involved. I think everyone will see that there's a real um, return on investment for that support side. Um, If not, they can just get involved with the business. And failing that, download the 50%, the playbook, CEO playbook, and the five levers of change that we talked about are all there in detail, all backed up by evidence, which you can just take to your workplace and share with your senior leaders. Okay, that's all the time we have. Thanks very much, Jack. Thanks to Karen and Claire for coming on to the Media Leader podcast. Uh, Join us uh, for our next episode on Monday. We'll be talking to ITV about their new generative AI ads. Uh, Really exciting. Uh, But for now, uh, thank you very much for listening and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.